Welcome to Fruity Knitting. This is episode 79. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. And we're really pleased to be with you again this week. We think we've got another fantastic show lined up. Yes. John Arvin is a UK national treasure. Because over the last three years that we've been interviewing key figures in the hand knitting industry, we've repeatedly heard knowledgeable people praise John Arvin for his unique spinning knowledge and his ability just to create brilliant yarns. So John and Juliet, who is his wife, have a small scale spinning mill in Devon in the UK, which has been built from restored vintage milling equipment. And some of it's over 100 years old. You'll get to see a lot of this milling equipment. It's really beautiful, actually. Mm. So what makes John Arben Textiles so special is the depth of knowledge and passion that he brings into his work. He's got a ton of degrees uh, in... Um, printing in textiles and apparel, majoring in, in spinning and knitting and also fashion textiles. He's had research grants that have taken him to places like Guatemala for backstrap weaving or to Japan to look at the technology in creating bespoke knitwear from body scanning, which sounds really kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so he really holds a unique body of knowledge which makes him heavily sought after by designers and sheep farmers to make them their perfect yarn and in our interview John shares some of his amazing yarn making secrets with us which is super cool but we think you're really going to enjoy the interview because apart from all of the knowledge that you'll learn both John and Juliet are really down to earth funny people and extremely likable so it is a really fun interview. Yep. And then we go to Baden-Baden, which is here in Germany, to meet a bespoke shoemaker in our Maker Series. So Matthias Wickermann is going to show us the art and fine craftsmanship of hand-making a pair of uh, custom shoes from a piece of tanned leather right to the final shiny pair of shoes, which actually last the owner upwards of 25 years. And we think that's, that's slow fashion. Yeah. <laughs> That is amazing. He also shows me how I should properly care for my favourite Australian-made leather boots, so that's also a lot of fun. We're heading to London to meet the talented knitwear designer and teacher Natalie Warner as our guest in Knitters of the World. We're going to be announcing the winners of our Martin Story Cow, but right now we're going to give the usual updates on our own hand knitting projects. Yeah. We're going to start with me on my project, which is the Saint Lunaire Griquet by Jennifer Bill. Here it is here. There's not a lot of work being done on it, but it is knit on very small needles at a gauge of 32 stitches. So it is going to take me quite a while. It's, uh, I'm doing it on the, with the Nature's Luxury yarn, which is 50% wool, 30% silk and 20% camel. It's a beautiful yarn blend mm -hmm. and I'm very happy with it. And I'm doing, I'm alternating skeins as you have to do with hand dyed yarn, which I really don't like doing. So conscientious of it's you, dolls. I'm really yeah. impressed. Well, I think if you're going to use really good quality yarn, you know, that costs a bit, you've got to, you've got to do your best. Yep. You, you can't sort of mess around on that. So it, I have to say, even though it's going to take me a while to knit and it's knitted on very small needles, it is an easy knit and it's a simple construction and easy to memorize patterns. So it's not difficult. It's knitted in the round bottom up. So you do the, the body and the sleeve separately to the underarms and then you join it all together and you work the yoke in one piece. There is a hem which is split at both sides on the body. You can see that there. So you're actually going to knit the front and the back hem separately in the flat first and then you join it in the round. Um, but the, I think the real special details about this design is the patterning that she that Jennifer uses all over it. So I want to show you some close-up pictures in, so you can really see how beautiful the patterning is and how it looks really fantastic with this yarn. So you can see that the textured patterning on the hem is very pretty with the yarn. This section is really slow to knit in a way because to create the texture, you purl two stitches together and then before you drop those stitches off the left hand needle, you knit two together into the same two stitches. So that's a little bit tedious, but it does create this really lovely bobbly texture, which I think looks fantastic with the variegated yarn. And then the main body of the sweater has an all over variation of a basket weave pattern with little eyelets and that's really easy to memorize. 
but the very special design detail is the twisted stitch cables that run up both sides from the split hem to the underarm and also down the inside of the sleeves. It's a really beautiful sort of delicate twisted stitch diamond cable and it's done on a background of reverse stocking stitch. And what I think is really interesting is that Jennifer has got those twisted stitch diamond cables to meet up or match up exactly at the underarm. So you've got a panel coming up the inside of the body and the panel coming up the inside of the sleeve and the little diamond points meet exactly at the underarm. And that would take a lot of effort to grade through multiple sizes, I think. Yeah. That's, that's yep. a real achievement. Yeah. It's not just mechanical. Yeah. That, that's amazing. But I love that little detail. And actually, if you look at a lot of Jennifer's designs, you'll see that she has these beautiful little details hidden in quite intimate places, which gives the garment a bit of mystery, I think. Little surprises. Yeah, because right? you're not going to you know, walk around like this, but if you do sort of lift your arm up and have a bit of a scratch and another knitter looks and thinks, oh my goodness, those diamonds gonna, are matching. Yeah, so some knitter's <laughs> going to stop you in the street. And Under say, here. <laughs> <laughs> or another, you know, dressmaker or somebody who knows about yeah. these lovely yeah. details. Yeah, because that's that in dressmaking that's kind of standard to look at how patterns yeah. meet up on the seams. It's what makes something beautiful and it doesn't have to be in an obvious spot. Having it in a in an unusual spot where you think you could get away with it, but it's actually really beautiful, I think adds value yeah. and mystery to the garment. So well done, Jennifer. I think I think I really enjoy those details. <laughs> So Jennifer has uh, designed the sweater with about seven centimetres or three inches of positive ease, and I'm playing around with that. The pattern says to start on the sleeves and then do the body, and I'm starting on the body first. And the reason why I'm doing that is that I need to know how much positive ease I'm going to end up with across the chest, because that'll determine how narrow I do my sleeves and the stitch count of my body chest and my combined with my upper arms will determine how deep I'll end up having my yoke and and how I'll work the yoke so that's why I'm starting with with the body so as I said she's doing it with quite a lot of positive ease and I whenever I do a, a garment I do try to modify it to suit my body type in the best way that I know how to and as I've mentioned before my hips and bum area is quite a lot bigger than my upper body so you're talking about your curves again now, <laughs> aren't you? but if I don't put in just a slight bit of waist shaping I can look a bit like a triangle now there is nothing wrong with triangles but Triangles are very important. They are very, structurally, they're yeah. very important, but I'd prefer to look less like a, a dramatic triangle. Yeah. So I'm just putting a little bit in. Now, normally, of course, I would put it in the side seams, but Jennifer has this stunning cable design down there, and I don't want to mess up that. And I also don't want to put any decreases in the basket weave patterning on either side of the cable, because that would also mess up the look of it, I think. It wouldn't look so neat and pretty. So I'm going to do all my waist shaping, well I have done my waist shaping simply through changing needle sizes. So if you can help me a minute. Of course. I started off with a size 3mm down the bottom and that gave me a gauge of about 28 stitches for, for 10 centimeters. And then I went down to 2.75 and then 2.5 and then 2.25. I'm finally on 2mm needles which is giving me a gauge of about 33 or 34 stitches. And that's just giving me a, just a very slight gentle tapering effect. But it, it always amazes me how much a quarter of a millimeter difference will make in needle size. You know, over the width, you know, when you take the whole circumference. Yep. It's, it really is an amazing thing, isn't it? Yep. Things add up. So you have to do a swatch. If you want something to fit you perfectly, it just shows you, you really have to swatch. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so working on the body with ch by changing needle sizes has actually given me like a big piece of material that's worked as a massive gauge swatch. Yeah. Because like I said, I'm bigger around the hips, so I'm not going to increase back out to the same width as what I started on down here, but I'll know exactly the needle size to use to give me the ease that I want here. 
and that's also going to help me choose the needle size for how I'm going to do my sleeves because this, the, the design has got three quarter length sleeves and because Jennifer's doing it with, a, with quite a loose fit she hasn't put any shaping in her sleeves so the circumference of the, the, of the cuff of the sleeve is the same as the circumference of the upper arm. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do mine slightly tapered and I will know how to do that based on what I've done on the body. So that, that'll be really helpful for me there. And if I show you a picture now of Jennifer's design, you can see that it has a ferrule motive around the yoke. Now I may need to shorten the yoke above the patterning because mine's going to be all over and more fitted. So I'll have to figure out how to do that. And I might also need to start my decreasing in the ferrule pattern earlier. And again, I might have to do that by knitting the top third of the ferrule patterning in a smaller needle size. But I don't actually need to know any of that yet until I've done my body and my sleeves up to the armhole. So that's the update on my Saint Lunaire Griquet. Very good. My current project is the Mura Cow by Olga Buraya Kafelian. Um, I found it good that you said that your project is a really easy knit, Andrea. Why? Well, because in my world, this is a really easy knit. That's it true. Is, <laughs> it is a very simple pattern and it, it fits my mental capacities and energy right now very well. So I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm knitting it out of the leftover yarn from one of your projects, Andrea, the Nightingale, which is designed by Nora Gorn. The yarn is the uh, Hebridean 3-ply by Alastarmor in the Pebble Beach colorway. Look at that. It is a really beautiful colorway there. Yeah. I'm not sure who's going to get this, this product, this beautiful cowl when it's finished. I actually looked up in the dictionary the definition of cowl, and that was interesting. It is actually a male garment, although generally in the knitting world it's seen as a female thing. It is a male garment No, I think cowl is unisex. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. In the dictionary, a cow refers to a thing, it's, it has a hood, yeah. but then it comes down into a cloak sort of thing, but it's a closed cloak. And traditionally it was worn by monks and also nuns. Like a poncho. Yeah, it's kind of like a poncho with a hood. In Wikipedia, they have a, a, a reference, you know, see also, and then it goes to a hoodie. <laughs> That's so, a bit confusing. Yeah, and if you look in, in those sorts of, of references... There's nothing that refers to something like this, a garment like this. So essentially the knitting world has its very own definition They've of made the word cow. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. it's actually meant to be a religious garment. Yeah, and look completely different to what I'm making here. Um, so I'm not sure who's going to get it. Uh, I'll show you a close-up of the, the patterning on this. Olga in the design in the pattern does recommend that you use needles which are slightly smaller than the needles which are specified for the yarn that you're using. And the reason for that is to bring out the, the design and the edges um, a bit stronger. And I've of done the that. parallelograms. That's right. I've done that and it does work. And I think the parallelograms here are coming out really beautifully. You sort of get the shadowing around the edges and it looks really cool. So I'm really enjoying it. I'm just a bit over halfway. There's meant to be eight repeats of this vertical pattern here. I've done five and a bit. So I should be finishing this week and I'm a little bit nervous about that because I think Andrea has been nice and giving me an easy, relaxed project. <laughs> in this, but I suspect there's a, a bigger challenge coming for me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't so much get into knitting as knitting got into me. I grew up in a family of people who were very keen on dressmaking, needle crafts and um, tailoring. So basically I had no escape. My great grandma was a machinist for Marks and Spencers when they used to have UK manufacturing. As a girl right from babyhood, my mum and grandma always made clothes for me. Uh, my grandma did most of the knitting, my mum did most of the sewing, and so most of the um, stuff that was my favourite to wear um, were things that my mum and grandma had made. 
after a couple of what looked like wrong turns in retrospect, um, I currently work as a teacher at Morley College, um, teaching garment construction or clothes making. Um, and I also design knitwear for Knitting Magazine, um, which is published by um, GMC. So um, what I try to do with both of those is to create a kind of creative escape for people who come to my classes and who knit or who knit my patterns um, because they need a creative outlet or they just want to put their own stamp on things or create something for their wardrobes that suits them rather than having to rely on mass market stuff that doesn't fit them very well. I always try to design knitwear or choose sewing projects that fit seamlessly into people's lives. Um, in my opinion, good design should be as beautiful as it is functional. When something is really well designed, it just fits seamlessly into your life. You don't have to think about um, adjusting it or configuring it or anything like that. It just works for you and you can just be yourself. So first thing I'm going to talk to you about is my very first jumper here. Um, I learned to sew before I learned how to knit and um, this garment was um, the very first thing that I ever knitted. Um, I was in my, I think, late teens when I made this um, and this was a bit of a rite of passage because, um, you know, you need to get that sense of what it takes to complete something. You just need to start somewhere and just get to the end so that you know what you have in you to um, get something made. And so I'm really proud of this. I mean, there's a few um, slightly ropey details. My, so my seams obviously have improved a lot since then. I just overcast this because that was all I could really figure out how to do. But it is still in one piece and it just reminds me um, that, you know, when I'm teaching beginners that, you know, this is a big milestone for them. And um, this reminds me of how I felt at the time when I made my first jumper. So um, this second one is um, a tunic called Little Waterfalls. And this was one of my earlier designs for Knitting Magazine, which was published in August um, 2014. I love this one because it has a good memory for me um, designing because I discovered the pattern by accident in a way. Um, I was trying to get or convey a sense of movement through having these quite sharp decreases in the pattern and um, the garter bit came about by accident when I was casting off the swatch because I often border them with garter. But it gave the pattern the lift that I needed because I was really unhappy that it was looking quite flat and one dimensional and wasn't conveying the sense of running water that I wanted. So once I um, hit upon that and thought that striping it would be a really lovely way to go, I decided that it was going to be a garment that was going to have a really simple shape, just this, you know, dom and tee, and um, just let the pattern do the talking. So um, this um, third um, design of mine that I've chosen here is um, one of my most recent for knitting magazine and is called the Nosegate Cardigan. Um, I included this one because this was probably, technically speaking, my most challenging design to date. You can see here that it's got a really nice panel of flowers going up the centre front. When I was grading the pattern, I was really particular about where I wanted them to fall um, for each size. I wanted it to be exactly the same because the square neck was really important. The pattern cutting teacher I had was quite, um, had a thing about necklines because they frame the face. And so when I'm, I'm designing anything, I like to just, you know, use a neckline that's really flattering. Um, so because of the um, placement, um, it meant that grading it was a bit of a challenge and it took a lot of trial and error and mistakes that, you know, I had to go through in order to get it the way I wanted. Um, I'm aware that, you know, to some people it might just look like an ordinary um, vintage style cardigan, but to me it was something really important because it just showed that, um, you know, there's always a way to get what you want when you're designing, when you have an idea in mind. So this last one I'm going to hold up is my um, favourite design for knitting and um, it was also my very first front cover as well. Um, so this is the um, Bonnie sweater um, which was on the cover in um, I think it was about May 2017 and the brief was for 1940s which I really like as a decade in fashion generally and when I was putting this together um, everything inside told me that it was a good design but um, no, nobody was interested at the time, so it had to wait about three years before um, anyone liked it. So um, once Christine, the editor at Knitting, said, yep, this is perfect, I thought, yes, finally, someone is interested. Um, and then, but then there was another hurdle when um, I had to compromise a little because the 
um, original yarn I wanted, which was a double knit, wasn't available. So I had to go through another bit of, um, you know, hard, well, not hardship, but difficulty again, trying to find a yarn that would work with good stitch definition. But we got there and it's on the cover, which is this one here. And um, there they both are. So yeah, a really proud moment for me and a milestone for me as far as designing was concerned. Thank you, Natalie, for your beautiful contribution there. I can imagine that Natalie would be a really great teacher, patient and encouraging, particularly for beginning knitters. Totally, she, yeah. what, what I saw there is that she is still very much in touch with what it's like to be a beginner. I love the way she pulled out the first garment that she had <laughs> and recognised what an achievement that is. Yeah. It's cool. It is. And you need to recognise. Sometimes you I get do. frustrated with your I work. I do get frustrated. And then I have to point out how beautiful it is, actually. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I also thought she's got a really strong basis um, with the, the training and the work that she's done. What is it as a pattern cutter for yeah. um, dressmaking as well? Yeah. So. Yep, I could imagine her students totally enjoy her classes. Mm -hmm. And I hope you all saw the lovely uh, waist shaping detail that she had on both of those uh, vintage garments that she designed. Yeah. And also, when you saw the, the cable flower, not the, the flower cables that ran straight up panels the, that ran the straight nose up gay, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah straight into the the square collar that was done perfectly to the stitch if you just mm -hmm. go back and have a look at that how exact that was that would have been really hard to grade yep extremely hard to grade yep. so that's that's an amazing achievement actually yeah. yeah very cute so thanks natalie now we have a year-long crochet along as many of you know and there's been fantastic projects entered into that crochet along and people have been inquiring about my own project how that's coming along so I thought I'll give you the quickest update. For new viewers I am actually a very inexperienced crocheter in fact I would call myself a beginner and I first was motivated to learn crochet because of Marie Wallen's design. She incorporates crochet in her knitwear designs in a stunning way to a stunning effect. But I didn't actually get around to doing anything about that idea until we interviewed Janie Crow, the, the UK crochet designer. And then I decided to tackle probably one of her most challenging heirloom blankets to teach myself how to crochet. So it's a massive project. I want to show you a picture of it here. It's called Bohemian Blooms and it uses a selection of beautiful Rowan yarns. Now it is a crazy thing for a beginner to do but it is technically possible because the way she designs her heirloom blankets is you start off with the easiest section and then each section gets progressively harder and builds on the skills that you've already learnt until you end up doing extraordinary beading and bobbles and overlay and all kinds of difficult things. And as you've seen, that's a really stunning looking blanket. So I've given myself a ridiculous challenge. I do expect it to take me well over a year, but I'll tell you what I've done so far. You have seen these side panels and there were four of them. They were very tedious for me to do, not because they're difficult, but because you've got um, striping and you've got all these ends to weave in. But I'm, I've finished the four of them and that's great. And But they are easy for a beginner because you're only starting off with a UK double crochet. So any of the terminology that I'm saying now is all UK terms, just not to confuse you. So this is all just double crochet, so you get a ton of practice in double crochet. And then at the end you have this surface stitch in that pink, which is very pretty. That's also very easy to do. So four long outside panels is the first thing you have to do. Next you have to do um, eight of these tiny little squares here, and they're going to be corner blocks. There's eight of them for various different uh, wider panels. So there's a whole lot of sections in this and the, the most challenging thing with this blanket I'm finding so far is making sure that each of my pieces are the correct size that they're meant to be because you have to think of it like a huge big jigsaw puzzle that they all the pieces need to be the correct size so when it's finally put together it lays flat and even and that's been a challenge for me. I, as, as you know I often knit at a tight gauge, I like the look of, of a firm fabric 
And it's been a challenge for me to loosen my crochet up because my natural instinct is to think that it looks too loose or, or not neat enough. I like a look of a neat stitch. So the very first one I did here, it hasn't got its outside ring on it, but it was about two centimeters too small. So I thought, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm gonna have to just loosen up here. So I have done that. Now back to showing you one of the neatest ones. So I have to say I am a little bit disappointed with how my crochet looks. I don't think it's particularly neat, but that's just part of being a beginner and I'm just going to live with it anyway. <laughs> so the stitches involved here. Okay, so let me tell you, you have to do eight of them. And in order for me to try to make sure that the eight are all the same size, I started off with doing the inner circle eight times and I've the got that. The inner circle. Inner circle. Right. Yeah. See, it's a square and yep. it has an inner circle. Yeah. So I'll very quickly tell you the stitches because I am, as a beginner, quite proud of learning different stitches. It's basically just using a, a UK double crochet and a UK treble crochet and then you do this fancy back post stitch in the dark pink around the outside. So... There's eight of those, all the same size, very happy. And then you turn those little circles into, still looking for a neat one here. <laughs> you turn those circles into a square by adding little corners to them. And that is, you're just doing progressively longer stitches. So you've got the double crochet, then the half treble, then the treble, and then the double treble. And that gives it that, that sort of progressively longer stitch which makes it into an edge and then we've got double crochet around the outside. I've done four of them, fairly pleased with them, just got four more to go. That that was actually a nice relief because it that wasn't as exhausting <laughs> as that. But you can start to see the colour. It's going to be a very you know beautiful elegant sort of colourway. They're beautiful a, colours, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it's going to be lovely. So that's nearly finished and what comes after that is a section of wider panels that involve quite a lot of techniques. So you've got, apparently you've got fancy wavy stitches in there, lots of different colours and there's bobbles and there's also beading. So that'll be my next challenge. So it's going to slow you down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that'll <laughs> slow me down. But I thought I'd just pop in there to show you that I haven't given up, it's still coming. And the cow runs until January. Until January, yeah, yep. or, or longer. <laughs> so you might extend it. <laughs> so anyone who wants, this is an opportunity for anyone to just slowly get into crochet, to expand your skills. You start with an easy project, easier than mine if you want to, no problem at all, or a dishcloth, and then eventually get to something quite bizarre and challenging. <laughs> My name is Matthias. I make shoes. Some of you all know the expression stick to your knitting, meaning stay within your area of expertise. In German, the corresponding expression is Schuster bleib bei deinen Leisten, which right. we can translate as shoemaker stick to your lasts. And this here is a pair of lasts, and it's one of a big collection that we can see behind me. And what's fascinating to me is that this pair of lasts actually is an exact replica of somebody's feet. So we're going to look at the last in a little bit more detail in a moment. But right now, Matthias, can you tell me how you got interested in the craft of shoemaking? 
the most important thing for me is that you can produce something with your hands from the first uh, step until the last step. And you can, um, uh, leather is a very nice uh, material where you can work with. And the feet is very interesting. It's very, um, it's not so easy like a hand. The feet is very sensitive and all the biomechanic. Uh, there are a lot of things you have to think about. It's not only producing the shoe, you have to think about the walking. And yeah, that's one of the yep. most things what, what I prefer of this job. Yeah. yeah, and tell us about the training that you did to become a shoemaker. Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I learned the job for two years and then I decided to uh, do it for my own, in my own business. And it's now uh, 15 years ago and yeah. The very funny way. In the first year, we produced 17 pairs of shoes, and now we are producing one pair per day, something like that. Okay. Who are your main customers? What what sort of people come and buy shoes from you? Yeah, we've got three different types of customers. 20% um, of the customers have got a problem to find shoes. Uh, orthopedic, the one leg is a little bit longer, or the feet is uh, smaller. They've got this kind of problems. 10% um, they want to have uh, individual shoes, yellow one, yellow boots. I don't know something like that yeah. and the most of the clients and this is the the important uh, for us uh, um, they they love the handcraft job yeah they want to come uh, uh, every time some weeks uh, again and they want to, to to see how we produce in their shoes and um, yeah that's um, a good way of working with this kind of, of yeah. customer can you walk us through the process from the the piece of tanned leather right up to the finished pair of shoes so at the beginning, we are starting with the measurement of the mm -hmm. feet. Um, the client is uh, stepping in a foam. Yep. And this is where we can see the relief of the uh, bottom of the feet for the orthopedic inside sole. Then we're taking a pencil and make uh, the lines around the feet to, to see what kind of feet we've got in front. And we take uh, the measurements around the feet to get it in the third dimension. So this is the measurement at the beginning. Then we start producing a pair of last. And um, the last um, we are using for, for the test shoes, that's the next step. Uh, the test shoes is a very easy built uh, shoe and the client can walk with them for two weeks. And after the time, the sweat is making an imprint inside, we're getting the shoes back, cut them off and we can see how good was the fitting. So okay. when everything is fine, then we we'll start uh, producing the upper leather. Then it's, um, the, the client can, um, can choose what kind of shoe he wants to have. And then we're getting and uh, cut him off of the leather and stitch them. And this upper leather is going down here in the workstation. And there we are producing the shoes. So um, the first steps of the shoe production here downstairs is that we pull the leather uh, over the last. Um, this is the outside leather, the inside leather, the front cap and the back cap. When everything is um, pulled over the last, we uh, make the frame around and then it will be hand stitched okay. all around the shoe. Then we fill it off with cork material and the, uh, the both leather soles. At the end, they put on the, the heel and when everything is finished, we pull out the, the whole last, polishing the shoes and then it will be ready. And it's totally um, for a pair of shoes, two or three months. Okay. And how many hours work is that in total? 35, 30 to 35. Okay. You're obviously working a lot with leather. Do you get to work with leather out, uh, from the region or where does it come from? And what sort of leather do you actually use? So the most of the leather, what we're using is calf leather from the calf. <clears throat> and it's very good. It's good for the winter or for summer. It's good for cleaning. It's, it's a leather where you can produce a pair of shoes um, where people can walk with it for 20, 25 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, this is coming here from France, from Germany and um, from Austria. People's feet change over time. They might put on weight or take off weight, or I think even just with aging, your feet can change. If a customer of yours has bought a pair of shoes and they should be lasting 20 to 25 years, what can you do if their feet do change in some way? Okay, when um, a client is calling us after some years and wants to have another pair of shoes and um, he says, oh, I've got a problem with my small teeth here at the side, yep. then um, we are taking the shoes uh, change it inside, take the inside sole out and um, put a little bit more cork on it or cork away. And um, when we change the existing shoe, then we are taking the last and mm -hmm. changing the last also. Stays and when, up to date. Yeah, it's an update and when, when your feet is changing, the last is also changing. Not everyone can afford 
custom made shoes. So if, what advice would you give somebody who's wanting to buy a pair of standard shoes? For men's shoes, it's very easy. I would every time uh, um, say that the people should buy uh, shoes, uh, Goodyear welted shoes, you know, okay. uh, because you can repair it for a long of time, for a long of years. And um, you have to pay about 200, 250 euros for, for this kind of shoes. Yep. And I would go to Autopedic um, to, to buy a pair of Autopedic inside soles. Uh, okay. And this combination, I think that they've got a good pair of shoes for a good price. And that gives you the beautiful fit. On yeah, the, on that's right. Yep. Yeah, great. So I've taken off my boots actually. These are my RM Williams, my favorites, an old Australian brand. I really love them, but I'm not sure that I'm looking after them properly. So Matthias, can you give us a few tips? Yes, of course, Andrew. So um, the most important thing is to use uh, the shoe tree. Yep. Yeah? The, um, the biggest danger for, for the leather is the sweat of the feet. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so uh, a shoe feet, uh, a shoe tree made of wood yeah? and not a polished wood because it had to be dry to take all the sweat. This is the most important thing um, that the shoe has got a long life. Yeah? And the, after the whole day when you walk in the shoes, in the evening you put in the shoe tree and this is the most important thing that the, all the sweat, what is inside, is getting in the wood. Then we've got leather soles. It's um, another good tip to put the shoes at the evening on the side, that the sole also uh, can get dry. Yeah. And um, this both uh, things are very important um, for, I think, 70% of the whole uh, shoe polishing. So okay. This is the first step. Then when you uh, want to polish your shoes, um, this is the frame. So the most of the shoe cream you have to put in, in this small area. Uh, some people use um, something like this to put the shoe cream on it, but then it's too difficult to come inside. Okay. And so this is the reason why we uh, take something like this, mm -hmm. you know, a small brush that's uh, from um, the hair of the pig. You know? And this is for you, Good. a dark brown and a dark brown shoe cream, uh, a wax. Um, another important thing is that you use a wax without silicon because silicon is making the leather very shiny, but it, uh, um, the leather is getting dry because it's like glue and then it's closed and it uh, can't breathe. And so uh, it's very important to take a shoe cream uh, which doesn't have uh, um, silicon inside. Yep. No? First of all, I start here and put the shoe cream all around at this area here, all around the frame. Okay, so um, both shoes you made matte uh, that you don't have any shiny area on the upper leather. Yep. So, and after that step, then it's very important. The most of the uh, people make a, um, a big mistake that take the brush and polishing and polishing. So, yep. but with polishing, it's getting a little bit more hot and wet, and you. Um, you only put it away, but at the end, it, the rest is on the leather. So okay. you make another step. You take a small cloth. And then, and not polishing, yeah. only to put the leather, what the skin doesn't need, put it away, like yes. this. And then you see this uh, black shoe cream, what you see here, this is what, what, it's, uh, um, what it was too much. Yes. Yeah? And when you make this, it's getting more easy and uh, a better result um, when you take the brush at the end for polishing. Okay. So this is a very important step, yep. only to put away the leather what the skin doesn't need. And right. now we're taking a, a brush and this burps uh, is made from, from the hair of a goat. Okay. Yeah, you can take the classical, uh, the, the cheapest one or the easiest one is this here, one the pig, then it's very typical from the horse and the best one is from the goat. And when you feel it is so soft, that is very and when soft. it's very soft and very close, then you've got a very good and easy result of the shoe polisher. So yep. take the spit, in, in, in the brush and then to polish. So here we go. So I've spat on my brush and I'm giving it a polish. What's the spit for? So the spit for is when we um, put the, the, um, the shoe cream away with the cloth, yep. everything is a little bit dry. Okay. And so it's more easy when there is a little bit spit on it mm -hmm. to, to refresh it again, yeah, to make it a little bit more soft. And then you are polishing so long that you don't see the spit again on the leather. Okay. And then it's uh, for a better result. And it's yep. a little bit easier for, for the polishing.
looking beautiful here. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, I think so. Matthias. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. You might remember around the beginning of May that we spent a couple of days in Baden-Baden for our 21st wedding anniversary, which was really lovely. Yeah. We did take the opportunity to get some extra material for the show, and that's the interview that you've just seen. I really enjoyed meeting Matthias. Very passionate and skilled. Yeah, we thought that as handmakers ourselves, you'd really appreciate getting to see other special makers and craftspeople. It's it's a real privilege to see inside their world, I think. Yep. Yeah. And it was very interesting, all of the, the, the different hairy brushes, wasn't it? Yeah. The goat's hair or pig's hair. Yeah. 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 Totally unexpected, Yeah. I have to say. And now that you're the official, well, you know how to properly care for beautiful leather shoes, you should be the official boot cleaner in our I'm, house. I'm a qualified shoe cleaner yeah. and I can see there's a queue growing downstairs. I've, I've got a few pairs of shoes that really do need some loving care. And some skilled. Yeah, skilled loving care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's now time for us to thank our wonderful patrons who through their financial support are really making the show available for everyone to watch. We do have to remind you that Fruity Knitting is a business. It is now going to be full-time work for Andrew as well as me. And we have decided to stay independent, so we're not receiving financial support from advertising or from sponsorship. And we also don't earn an income on the side through selling anything like yarn or patterns. So we are totally dependent on our patron support for this show to continue. So if you are watching, we do ask you to go to the take the time and go to the Patreon site to become a Patreon. It's, you can do so for a small amount and it, your contribution really makes a difference for us to be able to continue. So thank you very much. Yep, thanks from both of us on that. Um, our Martin Story Cal finished at the end of May and that means we've locked off the thread Yes. and we've selected our three winners. It was a really successful Cal. I think heaps of entries there in the main chatter thread and lots yeah. of lively conversations, which is great. And we had 34 entries in the finished objects thread, which is also terrific. We have... Three prizes. Three prizes, <laughs> three winners selected. But before we go on to that, we just have to make some very honourable mentions Firstly, we wanted to show you these fantastic pictures of Lulu, who is Labentier on Ravelry. Lulu is looking so happy with her sweater, we had to share that with you. She knitted the Glacier by Martin Story in Rowan Brushed Fleece, which is a really brilliant yarn, by the way. It's a bulky weight yarn, but it's amazingly light and airy. So next, we want to share with you Todd's excitement because this is the first time he's actually finished a cow. So Todd, who is Blunt Knitter on Ravelry, finished just in time and he knitted the Cane Jumper by Martin Story. It looks great on you, Todd, so a big congratulations from us. Now, before we announce the actual three winners, I want to very quickly tell you a little bit about the prize. So Millie from Tribe Yarns is donating the three prizes and it's three coupon codes to her online store for £25 each. And Millie, Millie has an online store, but she also has a bricks and mortar shop in Richmond upon Thames, which is sort of on the outskirts of London. So if you do live in the London area or you're passing through on holiday, I think it would be a really great place to visit because Richmond upon Thames has got a lot of other beautiful touristy area things too. There's yep. a poppy factory there. There's the Hampton Court Palace. Yep, Royal Richmond Park. Yeah, I think, and Kew Gardens. Yeah, so also. you could make a really lovely day of it. We actually sometimes drive through that area on the way on our way to Wales, so we should stop and and, and pop in and say hello sometime. We could do that. So Millie also has a huge online shop and she's independent and she only stocks things that she personally really adores. So looking through, she's got many of the top yarn brands and hand dyed companies, but she also has very affordable favorites like West Yorkshire Spinners and Coop Knits. So the winners can look through and pick exactly what they want as their prizes and each winner gets a coupon code for 25 pounds. Our first winner is entry number 11, who is Julie from Townsville in Queensland, Australia. And Julie is Julia Place on Ravelry, and she knitted this really gorgeous argyle vest for her grandson. I love the classic colorway that she chose, and she knitted it in Drops Baby Merino. I think it looks fantastic on the billiard table. Julie's photos are really clear, so you can see how really beautifully it is knitted and how neat the finishing is around the neck. So that's a massive well done from us, Julie. 
our second winner is entry number 11 who is Georgie and Georgie Simpson on Ravelry and Georgie knitted this really cute little cropped Fair Isle cardigan called Asprey and she used a mixture of Jamieson and Smith's two ply jumper weight and Hedgehog Fibers skinny singles. And if you read through her project notes, Georgie wrote about doing a lot of ripping and re-knitting just to get her colorway right. And actually long-term viewers might remember meeting Georgie way back in episode 25 when she was our guest on Knitters of the World. I think the cardigan looks super cute on you, Georgie, so well done from us. The third winner is entry number 12, who is Nika B on Ravelry. So she knitted the D cardigan, which is just a really simple lined classic cardigan. And she used Briggs and Little Atlantic yarn, which is a woolen spun Canadian yarn. And I think it looks fantastic. It's just really simple and elegant. And she's finished it with some really lovely vintage buttons. And again, from what I can see in the photos, I think she's done just a really a neat finishing job. Could the three winners send us a personal message on Ravelry and we'll get those coupon codes out to you. And thank you very much to everyone who participated there. Yeah, that was the point of the whole exercise. So even if you haven't finished your project yet, it doesn't matter. Keep going at it and um, you can always put your finished project in the Martin Story thread, not the finished object thread. So That's we can right. check up on it. Is our project in there? Your project? My tiger. Probably not. You better put it in. Put it in. I'm a little bit slack with putting my photos in, aren't I? Yeah, you're, you're a terrible... Anyway, we're going to move on. Coming, coming up, up now, now. <laughs> is a fantastic interview with John and Juliet Arben. You are going to love it. It's a lot of fun. They're great people. And we'll see you in two weeks. Yep. Thanks for being with us today. Bye. Bye. Attention, all Fruity Knitting patrons. John and Juliet are offering you a 15% discount of all their yarns, fibre tops and patterns and project bags and socks, so everything in their online store. That's a really fantastic offer because as you're going to soon see, the quality of their yarns is really amazing. So thanks a lot to John and Juliet and enjoy the interview.
Welcome to Fruity Knitting. Joining me today are John and Juliet Arben. John and Juliet are the owners of a specialist worsted spinning mill in Devon in the UK. And over the last two years that I've been interviewing people in the knitting industry, I've kept hearing lots of comments about John's expert spinning knowledge and the amazing yarns he produces, both under their own brand, John Arben Textiles, but also for other knitwear designers and sheep farmers. So while John's expertise is in the spinning and the machinery, Juliet is managing it all behind the scenes. Many of you will have met John and Juliet at the various yarn shows around the UK, and I'm totally thrilled that we finally have them on the show so we can learn some of John's spinning secrets and see inside their very interesting mill. So thank you so much to both of you for finally coming on Fruity Knitting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for, having, for us. having us. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> So because we have viewers from all around the world, can you first describe where you are in Devon, what the countryside is like, because I know it's very beautiful, and then tell us about your mill, what kinds of things you're producing, and what your business ethos is. We live on Exmoor, which is uh, on the coast of North Devon. It's stunning countryside, uh, rolling hills and valleys dotted everywhere with <clears> sheep. It's absolutely beautiful. It's stunning, yes. And uh, consequently, it's full of sheep. And that's where we source most of our sustainable wool from uh, via the wool board. And we're spinning a range of worsted yarns in our mill, uh, worsted being long staple, uh, using a various uh, vintage and cobbled together old machinery to to do it that I've I've sort of developed over the years. And John, you did some serious study in textiles before you owned the mill. So just tell us a little bit about that. I know you went to Guatemala and Japan for research and study. Yep. So my background, um, I came into textiles via printing and studied print at uh, London College of Printing. Uh, I was actually a, a colour matcher for a printing inks company and I learnt screen printing through that. Um, from there, I went uh, and studied uh, textiles in Leicester and I did, studied textiles and apparel to a degree level and specialised in um, spinning and knitting. Uh, to that end, whilst during the course, I won various awards, which I was able to uh, use the finance and look at a side project of mine, which was to look at backstrap weaving in Guatemala. Uh, and what really caught me there was the different colours that they use within the different designs, which are directly related to the village that the people are from. So you can actually tell where somebody's from, from the actual hoopul or, or garment they're actually wearing. So there, there's an identity thing going on. So I found that amazing and the colour interaction of that. Um, I also went to Japan and looked at uh, whole garment or seamless knitwear, which was in early development at that stage. It's actually a British development, but the Japanese had taken it on and, and taken it, expanded it much further. And at the time, they had um, a launch, which I went to for this type of machinery. And they had a factory boutique there where I went in and was at a body scan. And uh, they actually then produced knitwear to uh, fit me. Um, having seen the body scan, I wasn't sure if it was me or not. It didn't look like my shape, <laughs> but anyhow. And the idea being that uh, in the future, you could go to a factory boutique uh, on the high streets and uh, be scanned and then have a jumper knitted while you wait. It was a concept, so it was never really going to uh, take off. But I studied that and looked at that as well. And that formed part of my uh, final dissertation in my degree as well. Um, from there, I went on and studied in Nottingham and did a, a diploma in fashion and textiles. And there I was actually looking at the development of knit stitches from original framework knitter's stitches, uh, which a lot of the techniques and stitches they'd used have been lost over the over the time. And I was trying to bring those back into, into knitwear. Well, that's really interesting. No wonder I've heard such good comments about your expertise, because you really do have a body of knowledge behind you. That's, that's very interesting to hear. So, Juliet, what about your role? What, what do you do behind the scenes? I used to work at a record company, so I used to work with pop stars, organising photo shoots, video shoots, sleeve design and styling and things like that. Uh, I now spend my time channeling John's creative visions and ideas and and reining him in and turning them into um, tops and yarn ranges. I also do all the sales stuff so I look after all the wholesale and the retail and show side of things so I sort of manage that side of stuff. 
And recently you've uh, just started the annual too, haven't you? It's a new magazine. This was your project, wasn't it? I spent the last six months, I suppose. And the rest. <laughs> <laughs> developing the annual. We used to do a catalogue every year. Um, it has now grown into what we call the annual. This is the first year it's out. It's 50 pages about us. It's got lots of photos, stuff about our products. It's got some lighthearted things like Spot the Difference and beautiful illustrations. And it has four exclusive patterns we, we have using our yarn. They're all in the annual. And that came out early this year. Yes, I've got a copy. I've been looking through it. You've done a really good job. It's um, very stylish to look at, but it's also fun. It's like a fun magazine to, to read. So, yeah, congratulations Thank on that. You. Now, John, yeah. you've been collecting and restoring old milling equipment. Um, and I don't know anything about machinery, but I can appreciate that they have a real beauty about them. So is there a piece of machinery that... For, perhaps has a particularly interesting story or somehow um, has a special meaning to you? Or is there a machine that you've always got a grumpy and moody, troublesome relationship with? All the machines have got something special to me in terms of uh, their nature and where they've come from and, and the way they operate. Um, particularly, I suppose, uh, Butler, the, the, the spinning machine, holds uh, something quite dear. Um, because it's named after the last uh, worsted spinner in Halifax and it's quite a new, unique machine and that it's a, a small sample set that was made uh, for a, a spinning company where there was only two actually made and I don't know where the other one is so it's probably the only one in existence <laughs> and this machine's pretty bulletproof it can spin absolutely anything and it's brilliant and because it's a, a small sample set it will go on forever because uh, it's basically over engineered so uh, I'll say that it'll probably go wrong tomorrow <laughs> is it hard to work with machinery? Can you just give us an idea of vintage machinery? Do they? Is it going to last almost forever? The good thing about old machinery is that uh, a lot of it's solid cast and solid steel. Um, and they really did make these things to, to, to last. And also because they had to withstand vibration. I mean, modern machinery now is, is, is a lot lighter, not so heavy and not so heavy duty. And... Uh, basically a lot of pressed steel and things like that and they use a lot of more electronics and obviously computer controls with the older machinery uh, it's more hands-on and uh, more changing gears so in doing that you can actually see how the machine actually functions and in doing that you can actually see when something's going wrong um, it's just a bit more hands-on but it's more real and you're more in tune with it than you are with a modern machine. I think most modern machines that the operators are just machine minders, they're pressing buttons and in pressing the buttons they don't actually see what it is they're actually doing whereas our machines it's getting a spanner out, changing a cog, setting something up, adjusting a gap and then you can see exactly what it's doing. Uh, or not, as the case may be. Yeah. So you mentioned one of them's got a name called Butler. Do they all have names? Well, we rescued and moved and revamped and put back together all our machinery. Um, they're like members of the family, really, and they yeah. all have characters. Yeah, they all get a bit... <laughs> they all have their, you know... A sort of... Um, yeah, you get sort of used to them, the way they operate, and so you get quite affectionate about these so, machines. Which is why so they, they all have names. End up having <laughs> silly names. Some of them are relevant, some of them are just sort of, it, it's that name because it looked yeah. like that name. <laughs> <laughs> or it's, uh, but most of them have a, a name that connects to something to do with somebody with the machine. My favourite machine's called Gillian. She's the skein winder. And um, she is over 100 years old. She's a beautiful old machine. Yeah. She's named after a friend of mine. So I've noticed you've got male and female names. Do some of the machinery sort of distinctly <laughs> have a, a gender? Yeah, yeah a feel definitely. About uh, yeah. <laughs> I crawl underneath and I have to sex them. So that's how we uh, get to find out what they are. You can tell just by being with them after a while. <laughs> I could the imagine character. that. Yeah. I could gender. imagine. So just very quickly, is there a reason why you only do worsted spinning? I prefer worsted spinning, but it came about because initially when I moved to Devon, I had a sort of loose dream in 2000 to set up a mill and I and I thought I would do it with alpaca farmers because there's quite a few in the southwest. 
So I literally moved down with nothing and um, spoke to alpaca farmers and it's long staple and I, I started developing processing for alpaca owners and, and it sort of sprung from that really um, and consequently I'm kind of glad I went down that route because I do prefer the type of fibres that are off, on offer as a long staple so worsted is, is, is my preferred reason. You've also said that you're very happy to have control over every stage of yarn production at the mill. Explain why that's such an advantage to you. What stages do you think are particularly important to have this control over? Yeah, I have to remind myself that it is an advantage, I think. Because <laughs> <laughs> when they all go wrong, it isn't. Um, the main thing is uh, the, the, the quality of the top. So you're taking the fibre right from... Uh, after it's been scoured. We're not actually scouring here, um, but we, we uh, set our parameters with the scour and get it professionally done. And then once we've got control on it, we, <clears throat> we know exactly what we're going to do to our fibre and prepare it, what we're going to remove from our fibre, what we're going to add to our fibre in terms of uh, blending or uh, removing short fibres or vegetable matter if we want to take stuff out. And I suppose the most important machine for me is the comb. Um, that's like the cleaner uh, of, of the operation and that turns what would normally be a what's classed as a sliver into a fiber top and it removes short fibers vegetable matter and if we do it properly we get the, the right staple variation in in the tops which if i don't do that that can disrupt the way the yarn spins and cause all sorts of problems so that's that's the real key to what we do combing and i would also think first of all the fleece quality that you initially get is really important isn't it oh god yeah i mean it's not a magic system you're not going to take something poor quality into something good so you can't you, you, you've got you're stuck with what you work with so it's down to us to specify and select the fiber and be very careful about how we're buying that uh, to that end we don't just buy it willy-nilly we have a really good wool agent and we use the wool board as well and we uh, get to see the fiber especially down at the wool board because we're really near to them so we can see what's coming in and we can also get the fiber tested and evaluated uh, which is all quite important uh, you need to know that it's been graded correctly uh, there's all sorts of issues within uh, the fiber that can cause problems in the process in order spun yarn and like i say it's not a magic system you can't if it's bad to start with it's going to be bad at the end so it's that's key to making sure that what we've got is right yeah so much knowledge really does go into the process of designing a top quality yarn so what are some of the decisions that you have to make along this process for example is there any key principles that you use as guidelines or are you are there any flaws or weaknesses that you're consciously trying to look out for to avoid Okay, well the, the sort of guiding uh, principle for, for making a yarn is is the end, basically. It's what do you want, how do you want the textile or garment to perform at the end of it? And then you work backwards. So if you want a really good s stitch definition, if you want luster, if you want the squidgy and bouncy yarn, a very full yarn, very tight yarn in the garment, do you want it to be a, a, a resistance to abrasion, uh, for example, then all these factors you have to uh, think about as far as the end, end use. Then you go back and then you go to the start and then you decide what fibres you're going to select and how and how much twist and, and what sort of fiber is going to perform better and what sort of blend is going to work and what sort of coloring are you how you're going to dye the tops etc do you want a melange of color do you want the yarn to be dyed so there's a whole host of things but uh, it's the end if you see what i mean rather than yes. the, the start yeah that makes sense is there anything that you are consciously trying to avoid that you know you you want to any flaws or weaknesses? Uh, you're always aware of the, the f flaws and weaknesses. Um, basically, you sort of compensate for those or you decide that I can live with that because uh, it's, it's say, like it's a very soft line, like with Merino, Merino can peel. Uh, you, you twist it too hard and it loses all its softness and bounce. Um, so do you want it to be a hard yarn or do you want it to be soft? Or do you want to monkey with the fiber, which they do with a lot of fiber, uh, merino, and coat it 
just to give it anti-pill and things like that. So no, we want it in a natural state. So you kind of go, I want a really good yarn, but it's got to be as natural as possible. And we don't want to play with a fiber. Uh, and, you, you know, things like that, you, you're aware of, but you, you sort of allow for, if you know what I mean, in your yarn. So what about your Devonia yarn? How did you design that? Okay, uh, well that started on holiday, bizarrely, because uh, <laughs> <It did. laughs> we come across a, uh, a um, an exhibition by an artist, a tapestry artist uh, called Jean Lecat, who was, uh, I suppose he's like the uh, Picasso of tapestry, and he was around at the same time, in fact they were friends, and we'd stumbled across his exhibition, and the colours that this guy used were just incredible, and uh, what he did was he had the the the, uh, the wall dyed specifically to his shades and then had all these massive wall tapestries produced so we were sort of quite taken by that and I instantly went I could use this guy's colours and, and make a palette from it um, and then uh, what we wanted to do was have a, a yarn that was basically um, going to give us a really good definition in the knit uh, a little bit of luster in it and uh, also a bit bit durable so it's not going to be like a soft super soft yarn it's uh, more of a, a real robust yarn that's going to going to last and what better than to use the source of our local environment so we wanted something that was really unique to Exmoor and Devon so we used it made it with purely from fibers that uh, we could use from from our local area so it's got Wentydale in it our local cross which is Exmoor Blueface and Blueface Leicester which have all been selected from from a local area so that <clears throat> that development came about initially from a color influence and then wanting it to be like a, a good quality robust yarn for another example, I could uh, knit by numbers is a great one to illustrate how we how we produce yarn and sort of the technical things that go into it. Um, initially, we dye the tops and then blend them, so we get um, the sort of color effect. So it looks quite stripy in the actual tops. Um, and what we do is blend in increments of white, so you can see from a dark one, it's getting lighter. So we've got set formulas for these to produce colors. So that's that's in its own right something that we have to stick to and be quite stringent about. Uh, from there, we then start making it into a roving. So you can see that the colours are starting to merge a little bit more. Uh, and from there, we then produce a finer roving. This is all done on Butler, by the way, my favourite machine, uh, <laughs> which is ideal for sort of short runs. Uh, and all the way through here, we're, we're, we're controlling the amount of twists we put into the rovings. Uh, the weights of the rovings and the way that the rovings are going to perform and the actual colour balance that we're going to get in the final yarn. We could overblend this and it would just look flat, but we keep it so it's still got a little bit of striping in there uh, so that when it comes through, you get this lovely melange effect in the final yarn. When it comes to the final yarn, it just, just so happens it's sitting behind me. Uh, <laughs> this is our knit by numbers rack. Uh, so I was talking earlier about keeping merino soft and squidgy. And, and that, that's what it does. And uh, so to get that balance right, I have to put enough twist into this yarn to what I feel makes it perform, but also gives it such a beautiful squash and feel to it. Um, if I don't get that balance right, the yarn will come out wrong, come out tight. Uh, if we haven't got the balance right within the fibers in the first place, we'll get uneven yarn as well. So you'll get thick and thin in the yarn. So all these things we have to be careful and make sure we've got it absolutely bang on. Um, and when you produce it in the singles, we spin it in singles, we have to then fold it or, or ply it, as, as uh, most uh, spinners would say. And that balance has to be absolutely bang on as well, because if you don't get your amount of twist right in the singles before you fold or ply it, uh, you can make a, a very... Um, yarn that's that's not balanced at all and will twist in the knitwear so i don't know if you ever had any knitwear that started yes. spiraling on you that's yes. because the, the yarn's all out of kilter and out of balance um which is one of the reasons i don't like single spun yarns because you have to pressure set them etc so it's all about that getting the balance right getting the feel right getting the handle right getting the tops right and then if you've done everything right from the start then you've got a good yarn that's such an interesting answer. Just a really quick side note. Yeah. Is there any way a knitter can pick up a yarn uh -huh. and and tell from looking at it whether it's balanced 
correctly or not? Yeah, if you take a strand of yarn and just unravel it from your ball or from the skein or whatever it is, and then just hold it straight between your fingers and then let it go back on itself. If it starts twisting, it's still got a little bit of lively twist in there. Um, if that doesn't come out, then that will that will stay in your knitwear. I mean, a certain amount's okay, but if it's particularly lively, your, your knitwear will start wanting to, to twist and distort. So that's a good test, yeah. Yeah, just do that, hold it straight, and then let it go on itself and see if it starts spiraling back. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do it to, to a point, but if it's really excessive, then you've got a problem there. That's a really good tip. So another example would be our Exmoor sock. This is, this is more of a technical yarn, I suppose, because you're starting to put elements in there that uh, are, are going to um, give it good wearability and also allow it to go into a washing machine. So the reason these are all these sort of things are done is because in, in modern, modern garments uh, or people's knitwear, they basically want it to go in a washing machine and they don't want to have to darn things. Uh, so you end up compensating for that. Um, so basically what we've done here is with the wool, we've treated the wool and we've given what's called a Hercocet treatment, which is the treatment of the outer layer of the wool. So you, you partially burn away the outer scales on the fibre and then it's coated with a, 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 a polymer which adheres to the fibre. So it smooths the fibre off and it removes the outer barbs from the fibre, which is the things that when you wash or agitate your um, garments in, in a hot liquid with, with soap, the fibres are able to move and the barbs lock the fibre and then you felt things. Yeah. With the barbs that are removed, then the, the fibres can actually relax and go back again so you don't felt. So that's what superwash or Hercocet treatment does. And the other thing we do with this is put, put nylon in, which... Um, at, at improves the wear again so in terms of abrasion with a sock because this is a sock yarn it that's the hardest part and on the heel and in the foot that any any textile is going to go undergo on the body and so you need it to 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 have some sort of strength there and uh, the nylon gives you that as long as uh, also with a very sort of rugged wall the other thing you can do as well i mean we've, we've selected uh, fibers in there which are quite durable but is increase the twist so increase the twists and the singles and the fold to make it more durable again. So it feel a little bit tighter than some of our other yarns and a little bit crisper. And that's that's due to the, the treatment that we've given it as well. So what uh, fibre blend have you got in that one? So this is our Exmoor Blueface and some Corridale in there. The Corridale is given an extra staple length and helps the, uh, the Exmoor uh, Blueface uh, lock in so it, the fibers don't come out so much and uh, also it's got some warblers in there to give it some color so we'll, we'll, we've added that so you can see it's not a solid uh, looking color and that comes through when we over dye it so you get this sort of mottling in, in the yarn and then 10 percent nylon in there as well to give it its durability so what's the process of working then with other small businesses who either as sheep farmers want you to make yarn from their fleeces or as designers want you to design them a specialty yarn that suits exactly their needs? Um, we do also make some yarns for some other people. Um, we make a commission yarn for Marie Wallen. We've developed a yarn for her which is called British Breeds. And uh, we've also make a yarn for Rachel, daughter of a shepherd, using her own fibre. So it's people with the same ethos and thoughts uh, that we like to work with. Um, there's a long process that goes into it before we actually make the yarn. Yeah, I mean, for instance, when Marie Wallen come to us, uh, she wanted a specific British breed uh, yarn uh, to work within her um, her intricate feral uh, designs and so she had a definite color palette a definite idea of what she wanted the yarn to be and how to perform uh, so i had to then work with her and select fibers that we thought were going to work together and produce what she wanted in terms of her stitch definition and the type of work she does and also give her that color effect a sort of slightly tweedy effect uh, in the in the yarn as well which again, this the sort of color blending that we do with tops. So we dye the tops and then merge them together. 
uh, we can do that to create almost like a tweedy looking yarn so that was a perfect fit for Marie uh, the problem was she then came to me with a scale of colors which then I had to color match um, which is it's fine when you're mixing paints you've got to mix fiber in colors to recreate a yarn so that that's quite complex and quite a long process to to actually do that and then get them bang on given that the parameters you're working with uh, the shades of the initial tops may not be exactly right for the color that you're trying to get at the end so we came up with the closest match we could using a specific uh, 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 dyed range of tops and uh, yeah we come in pretty close with that and then we got the year on absolutely bang on in terms of the way she wanted it to perform in terms of the type of fibers that we've we've blended together and um, I think she's pretty happy with it I think so much so that it's selling out very quickly <laughs> and we're struggling at the moment to keep up but we're, we're, we're getting there so um, can you say what breeds of sheep are in her yarn yeah she's got uh, Wensdale and she's got Exmoor Blueface uh, she's got Zwarblers and uh, she's got Blueface Leicester, but she's got the Devon double sorted Blueface Leicester, which is uh, it's graded once, then graded again. It's like graded grains make finer flowers, isn't it? but this is grading twice has, has improved the quality of the Blueface. With um, I don't know if people know, but you get a lot of Kemp in Blueface, and we, we take a lot of that out and when it's gone through a second time it's it's unbelievable when I mean, the starting point for this particular fiber was incredible anyhow and i thought it should go into something special so marie was was the perfect uh, uh, when she came knocking on the door i thought she needs to have this fiber in her yarn so and that luster and softness in there is superb well, she's a lucky girl, isn't she? <laughs> she is, yeah. I mean, but, you know, I've got things like that all the time and I'm always yeah. coming up with ideas and I, I've got a, a thousand yarns bubbling in my head and I know that different characteristics of the different fibres are going to produce different yarns. It's Juliet's job here to, to rein me in. It works with Marie as well. She's got very similar vision to us. Yeah, so yes. It, it really gelled mm. and we only make yarns with people when it it gels it ha we they, they have to understand where we're coming from yeah, and someone, vice versa someone comes on board and they, they've got all the right ideas then you know i'm happy to yeah. work with them if they come to me and just say make me a yarn you're kind of going well what what's what are you talking about what sort of what do you want it to do you know there's lots of questions yes and marie's had a lot of experience being the head designer from rowan she knows exactly what she wants it's not it's not a problem it's such a breeze to work with Beautiful and the partner. same with uh, rachel atkinson with daughter of the shepherd um she she's got breed specific with a hebridean and she wanted it to work and it was coming from a farm where her father works so uh, we wanted that to work for her as well so a little bit more technical making that one work because really it's a little bit on the short side for us um, but we then used Zwarblers in it, which is a similar colour, to give it a bit more staple variation. So the spinability would be a lot improved, and then the quality of the yarn's a lot better. Plus it's quite a spongy fibre, so it gave it a bit more fullness to it as well. So it's a good fit. What are some of the other things that you had to do with her yarn? Like, what decisions did you have to make with the twist? Or It's a natural fibre too, isn't it? You've kept it natural. Uh, well, it doesn't hold together very well, so you're kind of going... We need something to make this sort of uh, to come together quite, quite, quite well. So, yeah, we we just got to be careful the way that we prep the, the tops in the first place because uh, they can come apart. So you, you're just just handling it through the system a lot easier. And then the amount of twist you're putting in the rovings uh, to keep the thing together as well, and making sure it's not going to be uneven. And then when the actual final uh, spinning and folding again getting that balance right so we're not over twisting it where it goes hard but enough twist to, to keep it together and it's going to perform so um bit of a challenge but then if you know what you're doing you can sort of know what parameters you can work to and, and get it right so so there must be quite a few challenges in running a small scale mill is it hard to keep it at a controllable level um, we had the opportunity of uh, sort of expanding our mill yeah. not long ago, but we, we like to be in control and we like to be very hands-on. So we have kept it small. We've got a small team. We're all very close and very passionate and we like to see things through and have input from everybody. Yeah, It's very important for us. I think the important thing is with a small team as well, I can impart... Uh, the knowledge that we've got and uh, the team can carry on and I think it's important that these skills are retained uh, within our mill and not only our mill I think uh, 
other uh, businesses could be set up. I think it's it's a struggle. It's not easy, but I think there is room definitely in the UK and across uh, other countries where small specialist mills like ours could be set up. You can get the machinery. If you don't do this sort of thing, you know, this specialist sort of uh, skill gets lost and, and also sort of the creativity creativity gets lost within yarns as well. Yes, we definitely want you to pass on your your knowledge before you both retire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's coming soon. It's not, not that soon, don't worry. No. <laughs> so tell us about the mill membership quickly. Well, we have a mill membership scheme where you can become a mill member. Um, it's a lifetime membership for a, for a one-off fee um, and you get discount on every order you buy. But we also have a secret page uh, and on the secret pages, which you can only log into <clears throat> on the website if you're a mill member, we have limited edition yarns, we have special things that nobody else has. And also whenever we have a new range coming out, we put that on there first so the mill members get to sample it before anyone else. It's... It's sort of our extended family, our mill membership. Lifetime membership. Yeah. Well, I just have to mention that you have this video trailer called A Short Day at the Mill, and it's so well put together, and it's a really exciting to watch. And when I watch it, I think, oh, I want to work at your mill too. <laughs> oh, you can. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really a recruitment video. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But unfortunately, we have to um, wrap up the interview now, so I've just got one last question for you, and that is, what is the best thing about being a husband and wife team? Can I leave the room while she answers and then uh, I'll do the same? <laughs> well, we're both quite passionate and feisty, I suppose, but we do give each other space. We we work in different offices, which is uh, yeah. which is good. He I think we know been... each other well enough that uh, we can break each other and have a really feisty meeting. I think we've sort of some people have been sitting there and been shocked, and the next minute it'd be, "Do you want a cup of tea?" <laughs> And it's just forgotten because it's just work. So, you know, we're able to switch between yeah. our personal life and work life uh, without it being a, a problem. We don't we don't have bear a grudge with each no. other, do we? I Much. think I let John be John and I let him create and, uh, you know, and then he lets me rein him in. Yeah. And then it all seems to come no, together. She fools me into thinking that I'm making the right decisions <laughs> and she's led me down the path. And I let him have the... She likes to make you think it's my idea. I let him have his name on the tin, you see. We'll start arguing in a minute. <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> We're quite fond of each other. Really. I think what's really good is that you probably both have just as deep a passion for what you're doing so that yeah. if oh, God, you do you have to, different yeah. ideas, you know that you're both coming at it from the same uh, level of passion and, and commitment. Well, you yeah. live and breathe it, really. Yeah, when you a have a small business... You live and breathe it, so you've got to be passionate about it. You've got to enjoy it. You've got to enjoy who you work with. And, yeah. Yeah, we haven't bought the second yacht yet. I mean, just... <laughs> We've only got a rubber dinghy, yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been so much fun to talk to you. So thank you again for coming on Fruity Knitting. It's been such an honour and, and pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Good thank day. you. Thank yeah. you for your time. Sorry that we took so long to get here. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.